we're ready to go. So I, I think we, um, I guess we should put, um, maybe we can go around and do a roll call real quick. Um, I think it was everyone, but, um, but Angie. Okay, here she comes. Uh, Samir's not on, uh, let's see, Samir, Matthew, Denise, and Donna are missing today. Uh, missing, Denise, Samir, Donna. And um, Tiffany's on? Yes. <clears throat> hey folks, sorry for being late. Is, is, uh, I'm here. I'm just Rob, on mute. Rob Gill is on? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Angie Dries is taking notes. I uh, heard that. Where are you doing that, Dries? I can take over. <laughs> well, there is there is this folder. Uh, I'll I am you the link. But it's in the in the folder. Yep. And by the way, um, Holly, you said it in, as if it was some level of disbelief. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amusement, maybe, but this is uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, well, Angie's here to save the day, that's for sure. There we go. <clears throat> all right. Sorry, Mike Lamb is on as well. Just <coughs> sorry, we have listed. Yep. All right. All right. So we have quorum. Um, actually, Vesa is Vesa. On? Yeah, Vesa is on. All right. Sorry. Yeah. All right. The floor is yours. Okay. So uh, the first item on the agenda is the Q and A from the operational update. So I'll just give a <coughs> Uh, an overview of some of the things in the doc, um, and then questions as we go. Just feel free, free to interrupt me. Um, so I think um, just things to note, um, in July we had a staff retreat uh, here in Portland with all staff members except for one, uh, who just recently undergone knee surgery. Um, but it was great to have everyone here, and our focus at that meeting was to start to get all our ducks in a row for 2015. Um, and you know, start to get project plans in place that can feed into the budget and leadership plan. Uh, so we're already working on all that good stuff, um, and we'll be getting more details out to the board at the September retreat in Amsterdam. Um, and the finance committee will get a first look at those things before we present them in full in Amsterdam. Um, so. So that was a great, uh, you know, great amount of work that got done, but also it was just really great to, um, as we have grown the team and have so many new folks, um, just really great to be together and learn about each other and, you know, work on some of the culture aspects as well. So it was really good for the team as much as, as it was good for the work. Um, the tech team has been really uh, doing so much stuff uh, over the last month um, as well. So I think some of the things that I was excited to see put in place are the change notification emails um, so that hopefully deployments are no longer surprising to folks, um, which is good. Um, and then we also deployed semantic versioning for the Drupal 8 release, which was a big win. Um, and one of the key projects that the Drupal software working group you know, wanted to prioritize. Um, and then we also got RESTful web services deployed on Drupal.org uh, in August. And there's some more work to be done around that, particularly around documentation. But I think that issue had been open on Drupal.org for like four years. Um, so it's kind of cool to close an issue that was four years old. Um, so those are some of the highlights. Um, we'll get into the Drupal cons. We definitely have some issues there that we, uh, you know, that we need to to address. But those are some of the highlights that, um, you know happened in July that we're really excited to, to have going on. So looking um, at the KPIs overall, financially we continue to um, perform. Um, these numbers are, these numbers in the dashboard are uh, do not reflect our revised budget yet. Um, we'll get those updated for the next month. But uh, 
when we look at a part of a strong community program participation, that's down. That's because of DrupalCon uh, primarily. Uh, a little bit, the webinar has been a little slower than we might have anticipated. But some of them have been doing really well. So it's mostly DrupalCon there. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, ADO traffic, um, we had a big, I, I should say also the tech team on top of everything else tackled a crazy spam attack <laughs> in the month of July. <clears throat> and so um, uh, we have, you know, 2 million site visits for the association website in the month of July. A record high, <laughs> except for they're all spam attacks, uh, and we couldn't filter them out. <laughs> um, so we're going to try to figure out how to normalize that number. Um, that also hit um, the Amsterdam website um, and the Austin website as well. So we had to go uh, close down some loops and do some reconfiguration uh, of Mollum there. Uh, number of memberships stayed is, you know, stand above 3,000, so that's really great. But our renewal rate in July was very low, so Liz and Joe are working on some campaigns to pick that back up. Uh, that may just be a it's summer thing. Um, but this is the first year we collected month month by month data, to, so we're not sure if they're really if there's a natural cycle to how renewals tend to flow for us. Um, membership revenue, I think this is supposed to reflect. I think I messed this up in the calculator because I think it's supposed to reflect um, supporting partners. Supporting partners, and I didn't add supporting partners. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you add supporting partners in. It's, this number is actually green, and I'll fix it in the packet for everyone. Uh, and as we discussed that last time, we continue to see the average spend down. Part of that is people dragging the slider down, but the other thing we discovered in looking more closely at the numbers is that we have folks that are set to auto-renew from 2013 and, and before, um, and they renew at a lower rate because that was the price of the default price of membership at that time. So that also pulls the average membership number down those auto renewals also contribute to that. So the number of people dragging the slider down is not quite as drastic as we thought. Um, both things are contributing to that, that metric. Uh, and then, you know, in Drupal uh, adoption, uh, number of Drupal sites, um, you know, it's been remaining pretty steady. Um, contributors have been pretty steady. So is the annual D.O. site traffic. You know, everything there has been pretty steady. Um, and the one great thing has been, you know, measuring the responsiveness of all the maintainers. Um, that has been really good this year. So those are the overall KPIs and where we're at. Uh, on the DrupalCon side of thing, things, um, you know, so far for the year, uh, if you put in all the Austin stuff, things look good. Um, attendees uh, for uh, attendees overall. Um, you know, adding in all the Amsterdam and where we're at, you know, it, it's in it's in the green for now, but by the time we hit September, it's going to be an issue. Um, but these numbers are from Austin in terms of the evaluator, site owners, uh, you know, the, the kinds of people we wanted to have come to the event, um, and and we were able to you know meet those goals, which is great. Um, the revenue numbers, um, God. So funny, I did not see this the first time through. The revenue number year to date goal is clearly not calculating right, and I didn't see it when we put this together. Because we sh that should reflect Austin in there, and it doesn't. Those numbers will be probably in a yellow in reality um, because we had lower than budgeted um, attendance for Austin. We budgeted for the stretch goal of 4,000 instead of budgeting for either a smaller amount of growth or a flat, you know, a flat year. And uh, and so those numbers should be in the yellow. Um, <clears throat> other numbers, those look the same as the last time we reviewed them. Uh, but the real situation overall, um, we'll get more into Austin. There are lots of successes there, but just to get into some of the details again, um, we budgeted for a stretch goal of 4,000. We ended up with um, right around 3,300 um, actual attendees. Um, and overall, 440 training attendees with a goal of 500. Uh, we beat our business summer summit goal of, you know, was set, uh, or sorry, we beat the Portland actuals of 86. We set a goal of 120 in Austin. We hit 118. That's pretty much goal 
um, the community summit hit goal as well. And the net profit was behind because of that Austin, um, you know, actuals were we behind what we had budgeted for uh, the goal there. Um, so although we still had a very financially successful com uh, conference, it wasn't as successful as we had budgeted for. Um, we are definitely going to go through Austin in more detail, but that sums that up. Uh, and just to give an overview of how we how we ended up with fewer uh, numbers for Austin actual attendance than the goal, uh, you may recall we were really on track for what we thought would lead us to 4,000 attendees through the early bird registration period. Uh, and then in the regular rate registration period, um, we had budgeted for a lot more uh, folks to register in that period than actually did. So we fell way behind in that period. In the late period, we came pretty close to what we thought would happen in the late period. Um, that pattern has held true in Amsterdam as well. Um, we had a really successful early bird period, um, and we were really excited about the con and thought we had good indicators out there because we had so many more sessions proposed for Amsterdam than we did for Prague, which we thought would be an indicator of registrations. Um, the reality is that in that regular um, period, um, you know, we, we sold a lot less tickets than we had budgeted for. Um, and if we can follow the same pattern as Austin and, you know, come in at what we budgeted for at the late rate, you know, um, we're looking at a we're looking at a loss on the on the con, but are trying to figure out how to get it to revenue neutral. And we're already on, we're really close now, Holly. We're really close. We're now. really close. <laughs> yeah, that number is much better. Okay, now. good. <laughs> um, so and you see that sort of all through the numbers. Um, the hotel bookings are down um, as well. They, you know, from what we thought that they might be. Uh, we don't have any financial liability at the hotel, which is good, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically everything was down from what we thought it would be. So the team has been um, working on um, ramping up some of the, the marketing around the con. So we've uh, increased some of the communications that go out, the, uh, the group con newsletters going out a little more frequently in this period to try to, you know, pick up some of that slack um, and quit getting some messages out across additional channels. Um, but, but really the, the big factor for mitigating this is working on the expense side and, and trying to bring that down and um, it sounds like they found a few more things and, and we're getting pretty close to um, at least a revenue neutral situation. Yeah, we're at negative five right now, 5,000. Negative 5,000 euro. Yep. Excellent. All good according to plan. <laughs> um, so going forward, um, like I said, this is really the first year that we've been able to try to dive into the data and understand what does registration look like for a con week by week by week by week? The data we get out of commerce is not super conducive to actually understanding tickets that were actually sold and which, which kinds of tickets were actually sold and what kind of time period very easily. So we end up having to you know, manually um, get that data in order. Uh, but we've been working on that uh, you know, week by week. Um, and that will help us have better budgeted numbers for 2015 to begin with. But um, the other thing that we're doing is you know, working to get a community survey out there to understand registration motivations and see if we can figure out why registrations are flat this year, um, it's a, uh, you know, flat or down this year, uh, so that we can figure out how to address them in 2015 you know, before we get there. So I'm going to stop for a second because uh, I'm going to assume that we're going to have some questions around that. Okay. Yes. I, I guess my question is, do you think we'll? Uh, more sorry did you guys hear me uh, can it, uh, are we am I having a technical difficulty or are we having technical difficulty I need it now yeah, I, I think we cut off just yeah I, I think we're back if we did have difficulty carry on oh, so all right so I had a question um, do you think we'll have more data or 
you know, better insight as to why attendance is flat by the retreat? I think that we are planning to conduct that research in post post DrupalCon. Mm -hmm. So no. Okay. And that's because of a resource issue or just wondering if it's just lack of time? I mean, it seems like the sooner we can do it, the better. Well, I think there's that. But I think also, like, um, at this point, the only DrupalCon message we want people to hear is to, to register for Amsterdam. I, I think there's some concern about putting out too many con-related messages all at once. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to hear that we need to rethink that and push it up. How are you guys uh, going to collect data around people that didn't attend? Are you going to reach out to people that didn't re-register? We will, yeah. So we'll push it out through a lot of general channels in addition to reaching out to people who registered in particular. Um, and I, I think um, I have a, a, a slide that I can share as well. If I put it in here, there we go. Um, you know, I think we're looking to understand, you know, why people decide to attend DrupalCon, for sure. Um, we want to understand, you know, we have lots of questions about what might be affecting this. Um, you know, we've had some uh, anecdotal feedback that companies are sending fewer people now, so we want to check in. If you're a company, you know, how many people do you send? Is that more or less than you've been sending, and why? Um, and we are going to look at the attendee data to understand retention from event to event. Um, we want to understand what other events people are going to. Um, you know, those, those sorts of things. So the plan was to get this done in October to have time to really, you know, design a good survey process. Um, and, uh, and then not really, there won't be other messages competing with it. Okay. That answers my question. I, I don't know what the right time is. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with either. It just seems like this is, seems like this could be a key issue for us. And I don't know if there's time to, if you learn something, to even tweak things relative to DrupalCon Amsterdam. Uh, I know it, I mean, it's a month away, which is close, but maybe it's still far enough to, to tweak. I don't know. I think that's when we got something out and, and got responses back. We only have a week or so left to act on anything, you know. I don't, I don't know if that really will be helpful. Right. All right. Any others? Okay. Keyboard. All right, um, for Latin America, I just want to give you a preview. That um, site is going online very shortly, um, and we have been working with the community there. Um, just want to give you some insight into how we are planning the budget for that event, which was, uh, you know, taking the lessons learned. Um, we basically, because this event is so um, there are so many unknowns in this event. We took the most conservative approach possible, which is to uh, budget all the tickets as if they would be sold during the early bird period. So if we sell them in the regular and the late period, that's great. That just adds to the overall budget, right? Um, uh, but, but if we end up falling short of our number of 400, or if for some weird reason all 400 actually did register at the early bird time period, you know, we wouldn't be uh, taking any unexpected hits budget-wise. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the approach we took for, for DrupalCon uh, Latin America. So yes, that site opens very shortly. Um, and um, the one thing that we are, uh, um, you know, continue to flesh out and get more clarity on right now is the translation service. So um, we're, we have that set up um, for a key set of sessions. Um, and then 
uh, Lingotech has agreed to sponsor the translation of 20 session archives. So uh, if we record the session, we'll be able to um, you know, get it out in the alternate language as well, which is really great. Okay. Drupal.org, uh, we still see just this whole mix of uh, success and not <laughs> on Drupal.org. Um, I think um, same trend that we've seen all year long where site traffic is down compared to where it was. Um, and the number of comments, number of commits, number of contributors, all that stuff is down from full. And you know, we feel like a lot of that has to do with uh, where we are in the product release cycle. Um, and you know, just we've got a very mature product out there that doesn't need as much activity um, as a new product might. Uh, so there's a lot of that that's, you know, we think due to that release cycle, although again, we continue to try to focus on things that will help inch those numbers upwards uh, in terms of the Drupal Software Working Group, um, you know, regardless of where we are in the product cycle, just making it easier to use Drupal.org in general. Um, things that have been really great, uh, core contributors, um, continues to be above average, and Kathy Faye is so amazing, and, and, uh, and you know other community members that recruited people into that, so that's really great. Um, and the average commits per person um, is pretty solid um, as well, so we like those numbers. Um, page response time continues to um, continues to be in the red, though we inch we inch closer to goal month by month, um, and uh, the CDN has been standing up now for quite some time. Um, about a month, anyway. That's quite some time, right? And, and it's definitely helping. Um, so that that you know, we'll just continue to get closer to goal throughout the year. Um, test bot performance has been significantly improved. What was improved. that last month, Holly? Out of out of curiosity. Uh, what was that last month? I can look that up for you in a moment. Yeah, I mean, I can look it up too. I guess I should yeah. on the comment. I think it might it might have actually been lower last month, but last month it came way down from like above four seconds. Yeah. Okay. Just because I I thought that CDN was going to solve all of our problems. Like, do we have a plan for how to get that down even further? Because we've got the CDN deployed, and we got a, a comment performance issue deployed. Like, are there what's the next step in getting that number down further? Oh, down thing. Yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> the the changes that went out yesterday uh, related to our load balancers. Um, that should uh, also make a performance improvement. So now that we have it delivering well from the edge, we're trying to improve um, the delivery time to get to the edge. Um, because obviously the, the, the CDN is only going to really improve performance for those things that we've got cached out there. So if it's still having to, to run the query, there's still some you know, performance and optimization that we can do on the, the servers and, and load balancers themselves. So that's where we're, we're focusing the efforts now. The, look, the CDN itself is performing very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing um, awesome response on that. Um, definitely have cut response time uh, for our European users um, drastically. Um, we're also seeing pretty good response time from um, our our users in Asia, though I, we still we saw some issues in areas like China and, and a couple others. So. Um, there's some things to, uh, to to definitely celebrate in there, but there's areas for improvement as well. Cool. Um, and then um, Rudy wanted me to add via IRC that we're waiting for Google Analytics to catch up too because it's tracking full page load time. Uh, it, the actual time to respond for pages is only 420 milliseconds. So, you know, less than a second, really. <laughs> it depends on what number you want to measure. Well, but it really matters what the end user experience is, right? So yeah, it's yeah, good that we cut that time down, but you know. I know, yeah, I know, yeah. And we actually, I, one of the choices that we made there too is we're currently reporting the page response time out of Google Analytics because that's what we started with. But if you looked at our page response time out of Kingdom, which is monitoring our uptime and also uh, does some page response, uh, performance response. Uh, we're seeing really, really good numbers out of it, and it's um, it's got a little bit different approach to calculating that. So, I, overall, it's an improvement. Um, I, I think the little spike that we saw this last month was uh, um, was minor. Yeah, the uh, actually Rudy just pinged me again. He goes the, the the difference in calculation has to do with the difference of median 
versus average. Uh, Google is doing an average, and so those who are having really poor response are definitely bringing it down. Uh, but if you look at the way that Pingdom calculates it, it does it based on median, which is what are most people seeing, not what are the edge cases seeing. And we look really good in median. Um, it's okay, just, we saw some edge cases that cause the average to look not as good as we'd like it. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that reminder, Rudy. All right. That's right. Thanks, IRC. Um, and then the, the, app, the last bit here is well, you know, uh, landing page traffic, um, which um, you know, for, for not having a Google Eight product, uh, that page does really well. It's just isn't going to measure up to our annual goal, right? Um, and uh, we just got, went through process with the Google Content Working Group um, and have some, a plan that's going to be actualized shortly. Uh, for increasing traffic to these landing pages. Um, so uh, Philip uh, Boulevard, who's our new, newish content manager, works with Joe, is, is working to get that in place. And um, we should see some uptick in those numbers. Um, you know, the, the cycle of traffic should have nothing to do whether Drupal 8 is you know, released or not. That's just a matter of us getting our stuff together and, and being able to drive traffic to it. So we're doing that now. Okay, um, so there's a lot of stuff uh, that I already talked about uh, in the in the text here for for Drupal.org improvements on the software side. So um, I definitely recommend reading through it if you haven't gotten there yet. But I, I threw out my my couple of highlights. Um, and on the infrastructure time, um, I think we already talked about um, you know EdgeCast up and running. Uh, we had we had one issue there that's been resolved. Um, so far, uh, but that's it, and that's not bad. Uh, and you know, been working on load balancer and had some really good success today. If you checked out the Twitter account for Drupal infrastructure, um, so that's been great. And that's, I think, the sum of Drupal.org. Any other Drupal.org questions? Okay. Um, on the community side, um, you know, things still, still look good in terms of our engagement of the community around global training days and camp kits and community summits, all that good stuff. Uh, fiscal sponsorships. Um, we have a record number of camps that we're providing fiscal sponsorship services for this year, which is really great. Um, glad to do these things for the, for the community. Um, and uh, like I said, the webcasts, uh, we started kind of slow this year, but have really been picking up, and those have uh, gotten some pretty good attendance and lots of great feedback. Um, so we continue to do those, um, and you can get a list of those on our site, what's upcoming, uh, including the one I recently did on 2015 elections. Um, we also re record all those, and they're all up on our YouTube uh, channel as well uh, in their own playlist for, for web, uh, webcasts. Um, on the new revenue side, um, uh, the job board, <laughs> we've been working on that. Um, and we knew the release date was later than we planned, uh, but we do have um, we do have a product up in extremely soft launch mode, um, and so we expect to be able to release that out to the wider public on the 26th. I think is our planned uh, you know bigger launch date for that. Um, and so far, uh, as we have been slowly sharing it with partners to. Um, both get some content in the site and help us make sure that you know it, things are working the way they're supposed to be. Um, things have been looking pretty good, so uh, we don't really see any technical impediments to that release really date right now, which is great. Uh, and then membership, um, like you said, number of members has been great. Um, the renewal rate overall um, is uh, the annual goal seventy five percent. It's way off the annual goal. Um, member revenue, I need to get the supporting partner revenue um, locked in there, but that's actually in green as well. Um, so we're doing pretty well there. Um, and uh, you know, we've been running a lot of different test campaigns. Um, Liz has, which has been really wonderful to just see what works and what doesn't in terms of engaging the community and, and getting memberships, um, you know, getting memberships and, and renews out there. So um, I'm pretty excited that she's going to be able to take all that learning and put it into play in a bigger way for, for 2015. Um, and then finally, you know, DA marketing. 
is what it is. <laughs> but uh, I have a feeling we're getting close, being able to say some things, which would be great. Uh, and just in general, DA you know, communications have been getting um, stronger and stronger, you know, more and more subscribers to things, more audience that we're able to talk to. Um, we still, we recognize that we still have a lot of name recognition to build out into the Drupal community. There's lots of people who still don't know what the association is or what it does. Um, but I'm really glad to see these uh, numbers so solid because that means that we're helping to tackle that. I think that's our, you know, the big highlights. Any other questions? That took a long time this month. I um, have a question, which, so one, uh, you know, do we have any insight in how much time we spend on infrastructure related things versus features on the Is it like 40, 60, 80, 20? Um, I would say, so if I, if I were to break down the tech team right now and talk about how they're split out, um, I would say that we are probably fairly equal in the amount of time being spent on infrastructure compared to the amount of time spent on Drupal.org compared to the amount of time that's been spent on Drupal jobs and DrupalCon. Um, so I, I would say we're, we're kind of splitting our attention three ways. Um, there's definitely been more successes to write about on the infrastructure side in terms of, um, well, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Rudy is a very good writer. And so his, his section of the board packet tends to, to be really detailed and, and, and um, highlights all those areas very well. And, and we need to get a little bit better about highlighting out those issues on Drupal.org where we're making some really serious movement. Uh, a really good example there, I mean, the, the rest of US, while there are plenty of things to, to work through on that, um, it's huge to be able to have an API that we can start uh, working with the community to improve um, and, and have them begin using that API as opposed to scraping the site. And so that's going to give a whole bunch of options for, for development and integration that I think we can get into. Um, I think the, uh, the semantic versioning uh, was a significant um, amount of time that had to be spent on that in, in terms of pulling that in. And we, we have a really exciting kind of tipping point that we're working on right now. Uh, a couple of key profile changes are occurring so that they're removing some blockers for us doing some um, really great work around improving the user profile and how our developers look to the world, uh, but also making it so that our organizations can show that link between them and their users and eventually between them and their contributions um, at a much higher level. So I, I think we've got some some key blockers that have been being moved out of the way um, that are, are going to really allow us to speed up the process at which we're releasing new things on Drupal.org. It's also worth noting that I, we, we made the choice to hire infrastructure first. So one of the, the first two hires really that uh, we made for the team, um, whenever I came on, were on the infrastructure side. And so we, we definitely have some more momentum there. Um, but I'm really excited. We, we, uh, we have a designer and a developer starting on September 15th, uh, which is going to give us a lot more capacity to start cranking out some of those big changes to Drupal.org, such as having a responsive theme or um, uh, beginning to, uh, to implement some of the, the issue queue changes that we've been, been talking about wanting to, uh, to get in there and implement. So uh, that's all coming together. And I, I also I see a, a huge amount of progress happening with the working groups in terms of prioritizing the work. So you're going to see a lot more features start to roll, um, but certainly the things that we've talked about have been a little bit more focused on the infrastructure side. I think one of our challenges for 2015, and you know, we'll talk about that more at the retreat, is like, you know, I feel like we need to both accelerate the state of our infrastructure in terms of you know, performance, for example. I mean, it's still slow even though it, it's getting better. But at the same time, we also need to accelerate, in my mind, at least, uh, you know, features and functionalities like the application layer to to facilitate collaboration and, and all of these things. So it will be interesting to see how you guys envision, I don't know. But I, I think that will be a good discussion because I, I think um, we're behind on both fronts still. And, 
I, you know, over time, I would love to see the majority of the effort going towards features and functionality, um, personally, and you know, get the infrastructure to a stable state, so to speak, where it's humming. Um, anyway, we can talk about that more at, at the retreat. Sounds good. I look forward to the conversation. Sounds fair. Yeah. Anything else you guys? Okay. Shall we head to the next item, please? Is there a mystery? No, he's there. He's muted. There we go. Oops, sorry. I was a mute. I was a mute. Um, <clears throat> all right. So the next item is um, reports from the committees, I believe. Um, so let's start with the revenue committee. I mean, let's go down the list. Revenue, governance, finance, exec, and marketing. Sounds good. Jeff, do you want to fill in revenue? Where's that one? I'm not sure either. Megan, you want to hop in? I feel like I can give a quick update. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so just in terms of, of revenue, we're tracking really well. Um, we've been um, over goal on all of our on both Drupal cons and uh, supporting partner programs are on track. We did do a, um, a pivot earlier in the year because the tech supporter program was um, not producing the way we thought it would. And so we created some other um, avenues for uh, recouping those funds and they're, they're all on track. So it's really great to know we can move quickly, think fast and, and uh, achieve those goals. Um, we're launching the job board now, and so we're keeping an eye on that revenue goal, but we're working really closely with marketing to really get the word out. Um, and uh, the other uh, goal that's really left to complete this year are the web ads, the Drupal.org web ads, and we have some remnant space left um, that we're doing another campaign around, uh, and so we have another 30K there to go close, And uh, but overall it's, it's tracking pretty well. Awesome. All right, next up is the Governance Committee. And yeah. Matthew, I think you're the only person on the call from the Governance Committee. I and Matthew's not on the call. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I think there are no members. I thought Matthew was on the call. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, is there a... they're all out today. OK. Uh, finance Committee. Uh, Tiffany, I think if you can provide an update. So finance met last week to review uh, the July financials and um, you know everything looks fine. We did talk about what Holly mentioned earlier um, with the softness on the on the revenue side from DrupalCon's missing target in Austin and as well as the projections for Amsterdam. Um, that was really the majority of what we did and then I'm still, Holly and I uh, had met to talk about um, investment policy as well as ED succession. I think we're on the same page. I just actually have to write it up and submit it to everybody. So that is forthcoming. That's it. Awesome. awesome. Um, the ex executive committee, we haven't met. Um, I think we can, there's no updates to report. Yeah. Any updates from marketing, Joe? Uh, just last month, I reported that Betsy Ansley, the chair, had left, so uh, still developing a list of targets uh, to go after um, for uh, for the chair position. All right. All right. Um, if there's sorry, any. Can I ask a, a question related to the previous section of the. I'm really sorry, I should have brought it back then. We still haven't announced dates for Los Angeles. Where is that at? Oh, uh, did we get them on the site? Let me check. It was getting ready to be deployed earlier. It's getting ready Thank to be you. deployed. Okay. Uh, yeah, it should be up on the site apparently any moment now. 
Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. We have, we're a git pull away. One git pull away. <laughs> all right. It's a static site, so we don't have a deployment process for it yet, and uh, it's it's all checked into the code. We just need to push it up the chain. Great. Thank you. And so it's at LA Convention Center. Do we know what hall? It's, uh, well, we have in LA, uh, just one moment. <sighs> We do know. We do know. I just <laughs> and we will tell know. you. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to retrieve that information <laughs> from the cache. Yeah. So we have um, we have the West Hall for the uh, exhibit hall is West. Do you know the LA Convention Center well, Tiffany? Yeah, I just want to make sure we weren't in Kentia because it's a dump. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we no, we we did a site visit. It's very nice. Okay. Where we're be, so. okay. Phew. I'm happy. <laughs> All yeah. right. Any other questions? If not, I think we should proceed to the Austin review. Great. All right. Well, um, so we have closed Austin, so we could uh, do this and give you. Uh, the full picture of where we landed. Uh, for the agenda, we're going to go through uh, this, just an overview of strategic goals and the new strategic direction, and then show how uh, attendance and financials and sessions and all of that uh, marketing uh, have come out. I have um, solicited the help of both Joe and Steph Elhaj to do this uh, presentation so that uh, it won't just be me speaking and they can speak to their expertise. So slide three, the uh, strategic goals. This is just a reminder of what we try to achieve with DrupalCon. And slide four is the DrupalCon strategic direction and goals that we had specifically for Austin. Um, accelerate growth to 4,000, attract new audiences, which we did a great job of doing, uh, and promote Drupal as a career. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Attendance and financials. Uh, Holly showed this slide earlier. Uh, we are we basically kind of copied Portland as far as overall conference attendees, just slightly under. However, when we look at all of the tickets for all of the programs, we beat Portland. Um, but of course, we were budgeted for growth and we came in flat on attendance with training down, uh, business summit up. So that just uh, points to why we have landed where we have for financials, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, next slide, uh, who attended? No surprises here. Lots of developers, front end developers, site builders. From the developer side, we had 11% beginner, 33% intermediate, and 56% advanced. What we found is a high percentage, and Steph will talk about this more, but a high percentage, higher percentage of people participating in BOFs in some cases uh, than we would have expected. And, I, and we uh, have some ideas of why that happened <laughs> because they're advanced and they wanted to talk about certain things. So um, that's interesting that project managers is almost as many as front end developers. Like, mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. very surprising. Yeah, that that was a that was a big percentage. Uh, the next slide are the industries represented, which we thought would be really interesting to take a look at uh, this year in this way. Our core industries are strong year over year, uh, education and tech services, NGO nonprofits, um, and then healthcare, retail, finance, and pharmaceutical are down. So the question is, does it make sense to try to go after these segments more? Do we care? Um, it's just kind of the nature of the con right now. So I think it's just a question that we need to continue to ask, uh, ask ourselves. 
they're not down year over year. They're so not down. They're low. just less. Yeah, they, they're, it's just a much smaller percentage of the overall attendance. Yeah. I have a question on that. And they're definitely uh, emerging. Uh, Sorry, you go first, Tiffany. Versus the Portland area. It, can the variation be explained by regional, you know, industry makeup? Hmm. So uh, uh, you were kind of cutting out there, uh, Tiffany, but I think you were asking why there is a variance between Portland and Austin, NGO and nonprofit. Or I think overall, like you know, why? Oh, I was just saying, can the variation be explained by differences in regional and in industry distribution? Very possibly. Very possibly. Um, we'd have to go and yeah. see. Uh, we'd have to get some data about the industries in each in each area. But I don't think any difference is super significant. I mean, the biggest variation is three a three point two percent drop for media from nine percent to five point eight. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So what, what, so what I've been seeing outside of DrupalCon is that the smaller verticals have been emerging quickly, to be honest, like healthcare and finance and pharma. Um, and you know, we have one pharma person on the call actually, <laughs> um, and they're they're quickly emerging to be pretty important. So instead of doing less, there may be an opportunity to do more and to think about how can we, you know verticalize, if you will, DrupalCon even more and make sure there is enough great content for each of these different verticals. Because mm -hmm. uh, there is definitely strong interest in the yeah, world I think on, on all in each of these verticals. So it's not an issue with Drupal not growing in these markets. It may be a content issue, for example, or a location issue, I don't know. But mm -hmm. right, if you look at how much uh, Drupal has grown in pharma over the last year, it's a lot more than is represented here, and I, I was just thinking, at least for for my own team attending, I'd, I'd be wondering whether they would all actually put themselves under farm, or especially when we have full-time people who are effectively you know, working specifically on Drupal for other uh, Drupal shops, etc. Just like 100% allocated to, to Pfizer and Pfizer funded to go and attend these events. So there might be a little bit of that, but uh, certainly gr growing a lot faster than you might see in these numbers. So you might see it uh, expand a lot more. Also, also, of the of the number involved at uh, involved in Drupal from at least from Pfizer, the number actually attending is significantly significantly lower than that because we're not going there for any kind of farm or dedicated content at the moment, just because it's it's not really there. If that was there, it would grow up a grow up a lot faster, I think. Mm -hmm. Sure. Cool. Yep. Great. Um, Next slide, strategic attendance goals and progress. Uh, the the um, personas that we wanted to go after, we are we saw that we were able to get. The C-suite evaluators is down primarily because we didn't do the CMS evaluator training, which is where that goal came from. Um, so that's why that's down. But uh, we feel good that we are attracting these different personas and we'll continue to focus on them. Now we have a kind of a benchmark for future cons. Yeah, I think it's important to note that we set it up this year so you could only elect one persona instead of 15. Yes. Which is helpful. Um, and I was really shocked at the number of content editors. Yes, uh, and we're, we're actually going to be drilling down a little more on that one as well for the next cons. Um, so. Uh, financials, uh, you can see where we ended up, 91% of goal. Primarily, it's because we had less attendees and we did everything we could to lower expenses to meet that, <laughs> to match that. Uh, but um, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't get it quite all the way there. Uh, the other variables were that Portland, uh, we had a $60,000 rebate in Portland, which we did not have in Austin and uh, more staff wages were covered by DrupalCon budget. So those are kind of two big reasons that we were a little lower. Um, yeah, and, and we're doing a marketing study to figure out why, as, as we've talked about. 
So here's just some more on why we missed net profit goal. Um, registration's flat. We need to refine more of the reporting processes. Uh, and, and then there were a couple other factors. With uh, In Portland, we offered the Symphony upgraded ticket, which added some money to our bottom line. And we did not limit nonprofit tickets in Austin. It's the last time we're going to do that, I can tell you. But um, we didn't limit nonprofit tickets, and uh, as a result, we were 30,000 less than Portland on this ticket type. Um, how are we going to address these issues? We're going to be budgeting flat for 2015. Uh, we're conducting an in-depth analysis of orders by ticket type. Uh, to use to budget revenue moving forward and um, documenting our policies for the budget planning and improving reporting. Thanks to Josh, we're going to be getting great reports coming out of DrupalCon. <laughs> the next slide shows uh, a, an example of how we're looking at tickets moving forward. We're looking at them by week, by ticket type. So this is just a mock-up of kind of how something might look. And uh, we'll be able to look at least as a comparison year over year at, uh, to see how we're, how we're doing with milestones for early bird, regular, and late. OK, at this point, are there any questions about that before I move to Steph Elhaj? Okay. Steffi, the floor is yours. Cool. Yay. Are you going to advance for me? Yeah, you just tell me when. All right. Cool. So I'm going to do a quick recap on sessions. Um, as you saw in the slides that Steph did, um, sessions ranked very highly. So high five content team. Um, these are the sessions that ranked, um, or, sorry, that had the highest attendance. Um, and what I deduced based on um, what I know of the speakers and of the topics. Um, topics are really hot. And also these speakers have um, some some street cred. So all of these these speakers are known for in both Drupal circles and outside of Drupal circles. Well, ma the majority of them are anyway. And I think um, that speaker history helped bring in um, uh, attendees for their sessions. Um, the, I put some stats at the bottom. Um, none of them were beginner, which I thought was interesting. Um, one of the stats we're starting to see is that people come to DrupalCon for more, um, more meatier content. So that's um, a good nod towards what we're doing for Amsterdam and getting in more intermediate and advanced stuff. Um, and also that people are really interested in coding and development and site building, which is um, where interest has been in the past. So it looks like we're still um, tracking good for that. Uh, the next one is for session analysis. Um, we took the, the evaluations that we received on the website um, from attendees, and, and I did rankings based on sessions that received five or more feedback results, which um, was surprisingly not all of them. Some sessions got feedback on just one or two, um, and I felt that those getting five stars kind of was unfair to the people who had feedback, um, more than five people showing up. So um, this is a uh, analysis of that. Um, again, a lot of these names are uh, repeat names who've um, been on the DrupalCon stage before. Um, one that I want to point out um, that was a positive surprise was um, Gwendolyn and Mike Anello. They did the um, Drupal Career Trailhead Lab, um, and they got a five star, which I thought was great. Um, they had some really good feedback, which I think we're going to cover in a later slide. Um, but it was really good to see that um, our career initiative um, not only had a good turnout, but it also had a lot of really positive feedback. People actually took the time to fill that um, information out on the website. Um, other things was that they had to have an average of 4.75 or higher in order for them to run. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and switch to the next one. Um, Oh, I covered these in the previous ones. Um, but the other thing is that, um, you know, of course, the sessions that have highest attendance are the ones that are, um, they have good content and have good presentation on it because you can always enter the room and then, you know, within the first five or ten minutes realize this isn't really for me. So it's good that these speakers um, have the ability to keep people in seats um, once they bring them in. So that's good. You can go ahead and switch. 
Um, and like I said, the Drupal as a Career Lab was really well. Uh, there's a quote in there from one of the feedbacks or one of the comments that we got from an attendee. Um, it gives us the idea that people are interested in learning about um, careers in Drupal, um, perhaps people who are new or people who are looking for um, maybe like a vertical um, shift. Um, and this ties into our movement for the job board. Uh, looks like we had 67 jobs um, posted to the um, Austin board and 63 in Portland. I think that for Amsterdam we'll be using the um, the subdomain um, Drupal jobs board, so we'll have to see how that um, tracks against this going forward. All right, next. Um, this slide is a little bit, um, it's not my favorite slide. What it shows is that we had 200 less individual evals um, received from people, um, which on the grand scheme of things, I don't know if it's actually usable. So the things that we picked up was that um, out of all of the evaluations received, 78% um, of them scored above 3.5, which for me is a passing grade. Hooray them. Um, but in Portland, we had 85. And what's the discrepancy? So I did an analysis, and I broke down all of the feedback scores, and I tried to see if there was a pattern and whether the 200 really made an impact or not. And I really couldn't see that it made a difference. Um, the only thing that I noticed was that we maybe got more comments um, in Austin than in Portland, but overall, it, what, there was nothing that really stuck out as um, Portland did significantly better or Austin did significantly worse or anything like that. I mean, for the for the most part, the bell curve on a response of how many evals were received per session and their rating, it kind of did a similar bell curve. So there was nothing really that stood out. Um, the only thing that I could think of that was something that we need to improve on is figuring out a way to get people to give feedback. Um, and one of the things that we thought of was maybe the system that we have is clunky um, and maybe using something that's more intuitive or something that is usable to other people like joined in would be more of an incentive for people to use it. So Stephanie, I have a question. Do, um, yeah. do, do the speakers get to see their own reviews? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I was going to say, that is news to me, and like, I, if I knew I could see my own reviews, which I don't see a way for me to see that on my session note, but anyway, that might incentivize speakers to get the word out to, for people to test it. You know yes. what I mean? Like, yes. Cause, yeah. Because I yeah, only no, see so that's, that's, edit, a that's a great thing. So that's two points. points. So one, speakers can see their own evals, but it's in their user profile on the website. Um, Two, I suspect that one of the reasons that we had fewer feedback from people is because um, I did a review of the videos we had posted from Austin, and um, almost every one of like the 20 that I just randomly picked out didn't have a evaluate this slide slide in their um, presentation. So people weren't being reminded constantly that that was important. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe just saying that in the closing session, but I think we do. Um, or is there something like is there some touch point that people have I don't know yeah it's, it's tricky right because after you get home from the conference then like you got to get back to your life and stuff so it's, it's you really got to be in the moment I want to text people but that's another story for another day <laughs> <laughs> nice okay I had no idea I could see evaluations so maybe just adding a tab on the session node that's visible to speakers because then if I knew I could see this stuff, I'd be much more inclined to, you know, get the word out for people to review it. So. Yes, and I yes, won't mention I anything won't about mention the part where it's in the speaker part email. Part email. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't read that. I, I go to the website, though, because I have to. So, yeah. anyway. I Being in email is a sad story. But you, but you just said the biggest problem is, is people actually following through. So I'm just yeah. saying reach out yeah. to speakers and have them do the hard work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we're hoping that the actually joined in kind of does that twofold, is it makes it public not just for speakers, but also for attendees. One of the feedbacks, the pieces of feedback that we got for Austin was, it'd be really great to see what other people thought of this session so I would know if the video was worth watching. <laughs> because with 100 videos, like, who has that many hours? Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can we expose five-star reviews on the, on the session notes? Um, you probably could. Um, 
It, the, the reason that it would be it would be something that we need to look at is it's like a series of five questions versus just a one question five star. So we'd either have to pick which one of those to make visible or whatever, but it's definitely something that we can look at. But for us, join in right now. Overall, and then, you know, that would work. And then again, it's like, you know, now you're looking at someone who's re watching a video and it's like, well, you're watching this, please rate it. You know what I mean? Like, so it's kind of catching people in the moment. Hey, Angie, not yeah. you love, love your thoughts. Because I do. I'll shut up. Can we find another forum for them, though? <laughs> I couldn't really hear what you said, Holly. Um, there's a lot of echo when. Um, Sometimes, but um, I, I suggest we maybe take this offline. It's a little in the weeds, maybe. I think there's some good ideas, but let's keep moving because we have uh, a couple of other topics to cover in limited time. Cool. Thanks a lot. Sprints? Yep. Uh, final thing for sprints is we had more people. Hooray! <laughs> and <laughs> lots more people at the beginning stuff too, which I thought was great. More in the you know getting involved with core, the core mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, but the getting involved with core had a lot more people, significantly more people in Austin than Portland, so that was really great. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, Steph. Um, so. Um, Overall uh, ratings, um, there's on slide 22 and 23 are charts that compare Austin versus Portland for attendee expectations being met. And slide 24 is a recap of that in words. So uh, the bottom line is that in Portland, we had uh, 938 filled out. In Austin, we had 454. So similar to what Steph was saying. But in both cons, we are meeting the core expectations for sessions, building skills, and networking. Those remain consistent and highest ranked uh, parts of the con. We're doing well with these top drivers. The minority selected to hire or to find a job. What's interesting is, so the folks that are trying to hire ranked it the lowest. Uh, the job seekers are a bit more pleased <laughs> this year that, than last. So uh, the question is, do we need to improve DrupalCon for hiring? Um, it's not a driver from the majority, so we don't really think we do, but it is a question that uh, we could look at fo putting more focus on. In terms of activities, another comparison, Austin versus Portland, uh, and slide 27 shows the feedback. Uh, it's interesting, in Portland, the top three uh, ranks were sessions, keynotes, and networking. In Austin, sessions, exhibit hall, and networking. So. Sessions and networking are the drivers. Keynotes were considered less useful in Austin than in Portland, so we're looking at how to improve the selection strategy and get out in front and really be able to promote some great speakers. We did get a bit more love for the exhibit hall, maybe because the audience is maturing, there, maybe because there was a ton of fun stuff to do, more educational opportunities there uh, in Austin. Uh, so we're looking to make sure that we have really exciting exhibit halls um, continuing. Uh, the other category was interesting. If you look at both of those charts, you'll notice there's this huge spike of people commenting on this other category. And in Austin, a ton said they were really happy with it, but we don't know what it is. We think it's probably trivia night and women in Drupal reception and all of the parties. There were a lot more parties in uh, Austin than in Portland, and that's what we think that is, but we need to unpack that a little bit and ask more specific questions next time. Uh, slide 28, the value that attendees uh, feel that they got from the conference. Um, 
you can see it's it's really in line. Uh, they're getting they're continue to be impressed by getting more value than expected. Austin, we increased the percentage of attendees who feel they receive much more value. And the question is, maybe we should look at ticket prices if we're exceeding expectations and costs are rising. <laughs> Slide 29 is the net promoter score. Uh, essentially, we have a baseline now, 53, a baseline. We don't know really what it means at this point, but we'll know next year. <laughs> the answer to your question is... Yes, 53. 53. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Overall rating summary, um, attendees like what they're getting. We're nailing the key drivers. Uh, we need to do better with keynotes, and we need to understand why the talent marketplace is dissatisfied and whether we should do something about that. So any questions about that before we move to marketing? Okay, Joe. All right, for uh, Austin, we used a four-prong approach, uh, and they're listed there, paid advertising, content marketing, email, and then social word of mouth. As I've noted there, uh, paid advertising and this content marketing approach were, uh, th these were new for Austin. Uh, and just a note, for Denver, actually, we did do some paid advertising, uh, but it was pretty limited to some specific sessions. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide, some results from those. So paid advertising, <clears throat> what we found was the impressions were high and the engagement was fairly high. We had uh, over 200,000 impressions and 4,000 clicks. Uh, we were sending people to the Austin site uh, various pages on the Austin site. We had set up a conversion as clicking over to the registration page. <clears throat> and so uh, it, that's a that's a pretty long path to go from an ad that you see on Google over to the site and then actually click to the registration page to start filling out the form. So that's a tough conversion, but that was pretty low. Um, another thing we uh, found from advertising, uh, this was my uh, first opportunity to use Twitter ads and uh, was was pretty impressed. The engagement rate was considerably higher uh, than Google AdWords. Uh, content marketing, uh, and by the way, we've always produced content for cons, but uh, that's primarily around communicating uh, dates and things like that. Uh, for this con, we actually uh, used a strategy where we developed kind of high-level persuasive content marketing the event. Uh, to our audiences that Steph talked about earlier. Kind of interesting, the topics with high engagement were um, topics like convince your boss and uh, how to become Drupal 8 ready. And that's Drupal 8 ready from a skill standpoint, uh, not necessarily preparing your company uh, for Drupal 8, but uh, hey, uh, site builder or developer, you need to be um, getting ready for Drupal 8. Topics with low engagement uh, were DrupalCon ROI, so topics more geared toward the business audience, uh, why you would want to send your employ uh, employees, you know, what is the return on investment for attending or sending your employees uh, to, a to attend the event. So uh, I thought that was telling. Uh, next slide. Uh, email, uh, this is always a balance. We want to make sure that we're communicating effectively with email, but not emailing so much that people feel like they're being spammed. Uh, engagement rates were comparable to uh, Portland, uh, generally very good with, you know, compared to industry standards. Uh, again, pretty low conversion rates over to the registration page, but again, that's a tough conversion. Um, and one thing that we did new for Austin that was very well received was this attendee daily snapshot uh, where we sent an email to all attendees with a quick list of the things happening that day, just sort of high level bullets and uh, heard lots of great feedback on that and the mm -hmm. metrics there uh, bear that out so it's like a miraculous number 70 mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty amazing mm -hmm. uh, social media um, was comparable to uh, Portland slightly up on engagement that's reach retweets and at mentions primarily on Twitter is the way that I measured that uh, one thing that was way up, which was interesting, was clicks from social media to the Austin site were significantly up from Portland. Um, 
up 47 uh, percent to the number listed there, 5,688 clicks to the Austin site. And uh, some learnings. Um, with the paid advertising in particular, it's really difficult to tell uh, because that conversion is so hard. Uh, it's really hard to tell what is actually driving registrations. So great for uh, awareness building, but we need to create more ways to direct, directly attribute uh, marketing efforts um, and paid advertising in particular to ticket sales so we can look at ROI and make decisions based on what's most effective and how to spend budget. Um, we need to perform research to better understand DrupalCon attendee trends and motivations. Holly talked about that a little bit, so that's in process. Uh, uh, and again, uh, general advertising, strong tool for awareness building, um, but we really don't know how well it did to drive registrations. Um, highly targeted advertising channels such as Twitter did better, uh, we thought, than Google AdWords, so definitely looking uh, to, to Twitter going forward. And on the next slide, I'll talk about LinkedIn as well. And then uh, just the last point, their audience is definitely hungry for content and tools that help them convince their companies to send them to DrupalCon. Mm -hmm. And uh, recommendations, uh, I think we can use things like promo codes and there doesn't necessarily have to be a discount tied to it, but I think promo codes will help us uh, with this tying the spend to the effectiveness. If we use a promo code in an ad, for example, and that gets used, we know that that ad drove the registration. Um, and, uh, you know, we may want to tie discounts to those too, but, you know, we'll see on that part of it. Um, again, I was impressed with Twitter and think that LinkedIn uh, would be another option to explore uh, for our upcoming cons and uh, would like to dedicate some budget uh, to LinkedIn, um, uh, that uh, attendee daily snapshot by email that I talked about, I think we definitely need to keep that as a regular DrupalCon feature. And uh, the research piece, again, mentioned that that's already in process. And then uh, despite the low engagement that I mentioned on the sort of C-level messaging, um, I, I do recommend that we keep uh, continuing to create content and, and trying to better target uh, those folks and uh, try to increase engagement there. Great. Any Thank questions you. before we move on? Okay, so just to summarize uh, quickly, so to grow and strengthen the community, we, we saw attendance was flat. Um, we grew skills with sessions and trainings, community summit. Uh, trivia night brought people together. We had 18, we awarded 18 scholarships um, for Austin and uh, from these countries. So it was an actual, actually really great program. And we hosted 57 countries. In Portland, we had 43. So that was fabulous. Uh, to accelerate the project, we supported more sprints. We secured venues and sponsorship for the extended sprints. So we helped with that in Austin, which we're doing the same thing for Amsterdam. Uh, supported the sprint mentor program, funded 18 critical con contributors with grants. Uh, Brian Gilbert led uh, the uh, core mentoring workshop. Um, and we partnered with Symphony uh, they had a day of uh, sessions, and we hosted core conversations again. So uh, we're meeting that in those ways. Promoting Drupal through marketing, we had paid advertising, content marketing, uh, email, and then social, as Joe just went through. And finally, uh, we generated revenue, 802.7. So thousand uh, dollars it's so looking forward uh, we want to keep offering great sessions and networking the things we're looking at improving are budgeting and reporting understanding why attendance is flat improving keynote process increasing the number of evaluations we're going to try joined in and determining if it's time for a price increase to match the value and that is all All right, any questions or thoughts? Do 
be cleaning their minds with all the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually going to be my feedback. Um, it's all it, well, it's a lot of data, which is great because we didn't have that much data in the past. So I think that's a great improvement. I think the next step is, you know, I think ideally we would, you know, analyze the data a little bit more and come to more insights and maybe recommendations. I, I, I'm, you know, maybe this is the next step. But I, I for sure would love to know how we boil all of that information into here's the things we're going to change. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we had some, uh, you know, we had some learnings on that last slide, some things that we're going to work towards for sure that the data comes right. back. Um, I think what we, you know, our next step is to try to backfill some of that data. So mm -hmm. we just looked at Austin and what we knew about Portland, where we were proactively pulling more numbers. Uh, there's some data that we can collect from the previous cons that we can backfill for, and that might help us tell a more complete story because obviously with just two North American cons worth of data, it's hard to call that, you know, a trend line or, you know, really get insight out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's coming. Um, and um, the full board will get the retreat um, agenda shortly, but um, we're looking to have some more complete data for you guys to look at as a retreat. Awesome. All right, is there any other thoughts or comments or? Okay. All right, next topic is licensing issues. Uh, I think we're a little behind schedule, so. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can move the third bullet point to another month, Reed, but it's definitely urgent there. Yeah, the review of the onboarding. Yeah, so let's do the licensing issues and then switch to the executive session. I have a I have a hard stop. You know, in 35 minutes. Okay. And I assume others may as well. So let's let's try to stay within the. Sounds good. The available time. Yep. I will speak really quickly. Uh, also, I'm just gonna <laughs> unmute Larry in case he needs to correct me. You're unmuted, Larry. Just, you know. Uh. Great. So just so you know, there's an overview of um, the issues that sort of one of the reasons that sort of instigated the you know wanting to talk about um, talk about this in the board at the board level. But uh, I put together a uh, a presentation here after taking some time to meet with community members who've been working on licensing on Drupal Network for a number of years. Um, and they've all looked at these slides, these slides. So hopefully it all makes sense to them. But um, the, the general problem is that we have lots of licensing issues that are on Drupal.org. Um, things have been called out uh, as um, you know being non-compliant or questions that people have that go unanswered. Um, and when those questions are getting answered or when the issues are being resolved, um, it's the basic feeling of folks involved that um, how we apply the policies that do exist is pretty inconsistent. Um, so both things are a problem for the association because we are legally responsible, right? Um, and additionally, licensing does present some, there's a relationship between licensing and security. Um, so we are going to want to make sure that we are, we have policies that are being consistently applied um, from a security perspective as well. So, as I mentioned, I pulled a bunch of books together. Here's who attended and was able to contribute. Um, and I took some notes, which should be accessible to everyone. Um, and we agreed during that, um, that meeting that any issues that were found by folks uh, would be tagged licensing policy. And so you can click through and see all the issues that are now tagged with that um, on Drupal.org. And it's a not insignificant number, and some of them are really old. So there are a few reasons um, that these folks uh, felt that uh, felt that we were running into this problem, and uh, they they basically oops, they basically let's get back to them um, the number of posts that um, the number of posts that we have about licensing issues is increasing. Um, there are more reports being made, 
Um, and that when the posts are made, they're being tagged inconsistently, so they end up all over the place. It's kind of hard to tell what's really out there. Most of the time, and I think our standard policy right now points folks to post these issues for the webmaster's queue. Uh, so if there's a licensing issue, most of the time it ends up in the webmaster's queue. But um, we don't train the webmaster's queue volunteers in licensing issues, right? Um, and so the general feeling was that uh, a lot of folks feel like they don't really have the authority to make a decision or make the call yet that meets the licensing criteria or it doesn't. Um, they don't have the authority because they don't have the skills uh, and knowledge to be able to do that. So we need to support them uh, you know, in, in being able to resolve some of these issues. So that's a problem. Um, we took a look at how several other open source projects deal with um, licensing issues. So I put these in here for folks to, um, for folks to peruse. Um, you know, WordPress, um, you know, in addition to its general license, they whitelist things that are permitted, like for fonts and icons in particular. Um, and they do allow for uh, licenses that Drupal.org does not account for now. Um, I could not find a process for, you know, how you report a violation. I'm sure it's somewhere. If you know it, I'd love to know what it is. Uh, Fedora. Uh, works a lot like WordPress where they have a license and then they whitelist other things um, that are commonly uh, included in contributed code, including fonts and icons. Um, they also have a list of licenses that are specifically excluded, right? So you, you cannot submit something with this kind of license and here's why, um, which I thought was a good, uh, good addition. Um, and then they've got a licensing mailing list uh, with volunteers who staff that and make the judgment calls and deal with the issues that are raised there by the community. Um, Juma, this is their this is their statement about that, um, and they also have an email mailing list where they deal with um, deal with issues. Uh, and then Mozilla was pretty lengthy; they've got a bunch of stuff going on. Um, uh, it's pretty complex how they deal with it, and they have a group, uh, a committee, basically, essentially that deals with uh, licensing issues. Um, and then lastly, um, the, I don't know, I just don't know how to say this. If you guys know how to say this, let me know. Aperio? I'm going to say Aperio. Uh, this is another contribution I got. <laughs> um, these are Mozilla public licenses. Um, but uh, they, they have this uh, you know, somewhat flexible sounding. In addition, it may be permissible <laughs> uh, to import third party code um, part of their uh, licensing policy there. They also have a licensing team that deals with um, issues that are reported. So the stakeholders for us um, in this is, you know, the association, obviously, we matter because we're on the hook things go sideways. Um, the project contributors, we want to find a resolution that really starts with project contributors because I think they're the folks that end up getting most frustrated, right? You just built a module, you want to get it up on Drupal.org, it uses an icon set, you can't tell if you can commit your code with that icon set or not. Um, and then I think the security team, as I mentioned, I also want to include because some of those whitelisted libraries are, you know, we may um, allow for a, a library file that later, out turn, later on turns out to have a security issue. Um, you know, the, they need to know what our policy is and how to remediate those kinds of things. So when I spoke with a group of folks, um, their proposal for how to resolve these issues and to move forward is to build an official licensing team um, and uh, you know folks that are training the issues that have a common understanding of how we resolve and apply the policy and can uh, you know always be tasked with answering these questions um, and we could put that team together in a number of ways it could be a community team uh, in the way that the security team operate, uh, operates where there's no board authorization, but also no board control. Uh, the second model would be to have a hybrid team with, which has a board appointed chair, like the marketing committee, um, but is otherwise made up of community members. And then the third model would be to make it a full board committee where all the members are appointed as in the working groups. So those are the three models that we could use to build a team. 
and we would want to obviously you know recruit folks who have past experience in licensing issues and we would recommend that we have one member of the security team serve on the licensing team you know mostly as liaison and the work they would do would be to um, get training advice from the association legal team uh, they need to draft a charter take a look at the policies and see if we need to do any revision there um, they would recommend creating a licensing queue so that the webmasters team doesn't feel like you know these are issues that they have to deal with um, and then you know announce all these changes um, and do you know, make, make sure that we have consistent enforcement of the policy including look at some of the, we may need to go back and look at issues that have already been resolved uh, but where the policy is now out of compliance uh, or the resolution is now out of compliance um, or was inconsistently applied in the past and now we have to rectify it. What they would need, a cue, some legal training from us, um, and uh, also proper get access so that they could take care of projects that are in violation. Which is one thing uh, folks said that they lack now. They can, they can make a ruling, but oftentimes they can't do anything about it. So next steps, um, get your feedback and put a proposal out to the community on GDO and uh, you know, get working on recruiting team members and a chair. We would get the legal team up to speed, get a training put together for folks, provide the policies, create a queue, publicize those changes, and, and then work on focusing on enforcement. So discussion. Sure. So I can start, I guess. Um, so I think this is a, an important topic. I think we absolutely need to up our game. I, you know, at the same, so and it's an interesting dynamic in the sense between the community and the S and the Drupal Association here, because it's kind of on this in this gray area. For example, um, you know, like I'm, I'm very opinionated about what license Drupal should be, and I see that as part of my role as a project lead to determine. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't be comfortable with a licensing team determining what license uh, core ships with. At the same time, I do see the need for a licensing team to help scale. Um, you know, a lot of the, the support um, to help resolve, you know, other questions. Um, so from a, so you know, I think we should, I think one of the discussions that we should have is what is the exact responsibility of, I guess, the Drupal Association, a licensing team, and also sort of, you know, I guess me as a project lead, but even like, you know, module project leads as well. Yes, um, um, let me, let me that Therese, that we did talk about that in the team briefly and nobody felt in the meeting, nobody felt that the team should have responsibility for determining the license of Drupal, uh, of, of Drupal Core. Um, really the focus was on what are the policies that we're going to have around enforcing whatever that license is. Right. Right, um, and um, and so there's that. Anyway, so that I don't think that's on the table in this discussion or in this envisioning right. of what the future looks like. So, yeah. So I, I do think it is a good idea. Personally, I'm, I'm I'm very curious to know what other thing people think as well. But I think I feel one of the things we should do is maybe try and draft a charter that outlines these things, like what is the role, what is the scope of the work of the licensing team. Um, and so that's something that I've done with all of the other, you know, groups, committees, you know, with the help of Angie and others. Um, so I'm happy to, to help take that on and, and to work with anyone else here, you know, Larry and or you, Holly, or even other people to kind of try and charter a, a draft um, Charter, I guess, for the license for a licensing team. Um, and I think the question is, when do we share this with the community? I think 
but maybe best to share it once we have a draft charter because then there will be something more concrete to provide feedback on. I mean, it's not like we can share it early, but um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I feel like from my perspective, these are my, these are my quick thoughts. I, I was going to say I I don't th I don't see this as a working group where the board would approve every member. I think that's uh, because you know as as I understand it, this is going to be a problem that's going to continue to scale. So we'll probably need more members sitting on that committee than the board realistically should be appointing or could even handle in terms of volume. But I do think that the that the chair should be appointed by the board. Um, and you know, and I certainly agree that the charter should come from you, Dries, and that you know you could be the chair if you wanted to. Um, but if you wanted someone else to do it, I think the board would need to approve it. I don't. I just don't see it as an entirely board committee. Uh, I think one of the other discussion points, I guess, is is this a board committee or a community committee? You know, I, I mean that. That's exactly what I'm, I meant with what are the roles and responsibilities here. Um, well, I think because our mission has us, um, you know, we have to support financially the legal side of it. I think there has to be some level of board involvement in it just because we have the fiduciary and financial responsibility um, for the legal protection of the, of the Drupal project, right? Correct. Yes. Um, I, I agree. Um, I guess the question is, should should the board appoint the chair or not? I mean, I don't know. I think um, if the board is not appointing the chair, if it's an entirely community-run committee, then we uh, there's a separation. I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that if the board appoints the chair, the board has like control over everything the committee does. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, at the same time, given that, um, as Tiffany mentioned, we're on the hook financially and legally, it makes some sense that we would want to be able to appoint that chair and have that chair, you know, serve, serve the board. Right. So yeah, and I'm not against that necessarily. I'm just trying to think it's true. I, I think, I guess where I would start is, as I mentioned, writing up the scope of the responsibilities. And I think that will at least help me personally understand what that working, what the team members of that working group should, you know, should consist of. Mm -hmm. And and if that is a board appointed chair or not, I can easily see it being a board appointed chair. But I, I guess I would like to think about it more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If I may, I'll be able to have a session around at DrupalCon or even a breakout session at the retreat or something. I don't know if we can wait that long, but. Um, uh, Dries, if I may, uh, Holly just unmuted me. Yeah, go for, go for it. So I do think, uh, I, I agree with Tiffany that it should be a board appointed chair. Um, in part, you know, as uh, you know, she and Holly said, the, the, the association is on the hook if you know, everything goes nutty, uh, but also because that does lend some uh, credence and authority to the group. Specifically, the kind of questions that are open right now that I believe this group would be responsible for resolving are things like, under what circumstances do we allow GPL-compatible third-party code to be checked in to a repository? Right now, the rule on that is if someone happens to say so somewhere and people remember it, and we need to do better than that. So this group would be charged with you know, what the guidelines are for that decision, enforcing that decision and then recording when we've made allowances for that. Um, so that, that group would be responsible for things like do we allow you know, a GPL incompatible font to be used by a module or by core um, 
because there's no legal reason why we can't because it's a font, not code. Our usual policy historically has been it's not GPL, so you can't put it in the repository, period. Should we change that, uh, th this group would be the forum in which that decision is discussed and gets made. Um, and then being a working group you know, with an appointed DA chair, it would have the authority to be able to say you know, yes or no uh, on that rather than sit and wait until there's consensus which historically has not worked very well on this question. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of things that I see in scope for it. Um, you know, certainly Drupal itself is a GPL that physically can't change. Um, so that, that's not even on the table or anything like that. Uh, it's more, um, you know, the, the tactical logistics of the fact that we're now working in a much more multi-licensing world and we need to manage that better than we are. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that, with the exception that it's just tactical, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. these decisions have huge strategic impacts or could, could have big strategic mm -hmm. uh, impact on the project, both positive and negative. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, I suppose that's another reason why it would be good to have the board's blessing on it, because then the board you know, has a direct conduit to be involved in any decisions that are farther reaching. Um. Right. So, well, a great. I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy that you guys brought this forward and that you're thinking about this and that you're, um, have, have put effort into this. As, as I mentioned, I think it's really important. So I don't want to be the downer here. Um, I don't know. I feel like this is very useful information. I feel like the next step is for us to. To have a breakout group, maybe to to brains, you know, to to carry this forward and mm -hmm. to and to make something happen. Um, so I don't know if, if you know if, if that's what you guys recommend it or not. Or I don't I don't feel like we'll be able to resolve all of the questions around this in this call. Mm -hmm. I think the ask from the, the people that Holly met with was, hey board, you know, we, we feel this committee needs to exist, are you on board with that? Um, and then assuming yes, how do we go about putting that together? Yeah, I, I think that there's two paths forward groups. One is um, we get the board to work on a charter or I can go back to um, the folks that participated at the first, point, first level and get them to work on a charter that would develop some of those mechanics to bring to the board a proposal. So, personal opinion, like we can go back to the original group. Um, I'd like to join that group. Maybe somebody else wants to as well. So we have a charter, we bring it to the board for approval. And so the, the board doesn't have to make the charter, I just need to bless it in the end. That, that's my personal recommendation here. Trees, I'd, I'd volunteer to help with that also. This is Rob. Awesome. Right. So I don't know the logistics there. To, I don't know who. Would, oh, there are the names of the people that are involved. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, I, what I can do is circle back to these folks and copy and raise you and Rob into the conversation um, and just set up a time to. Uh, to work on set of a process working on a charter. Great. Do you want to handle that in the same way the um, working group charter? Should I join that? Sorry, as... um, go ahead, Andy. Sorry, should I join that as well to, you know, since oh, up, I worked on all it's the It's up to you. I mean, it would definitely be helpful given that you've helpful. been involved with the other charters. But... Okay. At the same time, I don't want to force you to join this. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so I guess put me on there too. Uh. Okay. Excellent. All right. That's it. Awesome. Um, I think um, that is it 
for the um, open session. Uh, we'll do the, the review of the onboarding materials another time. I think we ran out of time. Mm -hmm. um, we only have 12 minutes left for the executive session. Um, I think we should do that and maybe focus on the, uh, the financials for Q2. Sounds good. All right, well, let's switch bridges.